Hello and welcome back. Um, today we're not looking so much as pottery as pipe clay as we're going to have a look at clay pipes. Um, there is a certain irony in this as I work for a cancer charity and I've spent a long time collecting and researching things that were used for smoking but we'll quickly pass on from that and move on to the introduction of clay pipes and tobacco in this country. Um, tobacco has been uh, used in North and South America since the earliest times. Um, in South America it was mainly chewed and so the Spanish who um, first discovered those countries um, didn't introduce um, tobacco into Europe. But in North America, especially where the English first made contact with indigenous uh, North Americans in the 16th century, um, the tobacco was smoked um, on a little clay shovel um, and this appealed obviously to the English and they introduced this back into England in the 1580s. Um, in the early 1580s a German visitor um, notes that the English are smoking and using tobacco and they produced instead of a shovel type bowl um, the earliest clay pipes uh, of which this is an example. Um, so rather than a shovel they produced a bowl and that basically became the way of smoking tobacco over the next 400 years. Um, the humble clay pipe in its day was virtually worthless and given away and thrown away in their millions if not billions um, and so they're found everywhere in archaeological excavations um, and actually have become very valuable tools for dating. If you get a pit group uh, with pottery and clay pipes because there is a natural progression of sizes and styles um, from the very early 1580 pipes right up to the Victorian era uh, they're quite closely datable and unlike pottery which might have been used for 30, 40, 50, even 100 years if it was an heirloom piece and then thrown into a pit um, your average clay pipe would have had a life span of hours, you know, at the most a day or a week before it was broken and thrown into your pit. So actually virtually valueless at the time, but now valuable archaeologically. And also, um, if we turn to mudlarking, very easily found and recognised on the Thames foreshore. Um, anyone who walks along the Thames foreshore can pick up pipe stems and very easily, even the long youngest um, aspiring mudlark can pick up a few pipe bowls as well. Um, so let's have a look at some of the earliest pipes. Um, uh, when they were first introduced into this country, tobacco being exported uh, from North America where it was grown into England was very expensive because obviously the sea voyage in those days was long and perilous. Um, so the bowl is very, very small. Um, this is the earliest one I found, and the bowl diameter is a massive nine millimetres. Um, there are some which go as small as six millimetres uh, in the very earliest period. This would date sometime from 1580 to 1610, so it's the first generation of smoking. Um, a nice heart-shaped heel there to the bowl. Um, but if we compare this with uh, an 18th century pipe, you can see the difference in size between the two. Um, these early pipes are sometimes called fairy pipes because when they were found later, uh, people thought they must have been <laughs> smoked by very small people. Um, so that's quite nice to find. Um, and then the bowl gradually increases as we enter the 17th century, the 1600s. Uh, the bowl size increases a little bit. Um, so if we compare 1580 to 1610 and then the next sort of size up is that one there, a little bit larger in the diameter of the bowl. Um, yes, the um, if you measure across the top of your pipe bowl, the diameter of the bowl from rim to rim, uh, the very earliest, as I said, were uh, six to nine millimetres. Um, by 1640, there are 12 millimetre. Um, by 1700, 16 to 18 millimetres across. 
and then the Victorians about the same 16 to 18 millimetres as a general rule. Um, uh, another way of discovering the age of some of the early pipes is the bore. Uh, you can see the stem has obviously a bore to enable the smoke to travel down it. Uh, and this was larger in the older pipes generally. It's not a fail-safe um, way of identifying it. Um, but base, um, in the um, 17th century, the bore was between 8 to 10 sixty-fourths of an inch. Uh, you can use a little drill bit to measure that if you haven't got a very accurate ruler. Um, and then later in the 18th century, that would drop and become smaller to 5 to 7 sixty-fourths. So, I mean, if we look at uh, an early pipe from the early 17th century, and then one from uh, late Victorian Georgian, you can see the earlier one does have a much larger hole. So that might be a way of um, identifying, helping you identify um, the age of your finds if you've only got a stem to go with. Um, so as we go forward from the, 60, um, from the uh, 16th century pipe, or early 17th century pipe. We go forward through the 1600s, through the 17th century, slightly bigger pipes, and there again, slightly bigger. So the dating of these, um, this sort of size uh, would be sort of 1620 to 1640 uh, in age, and you can see they're quite rounded, sort of like a barrel shape and that's quite distinctive. Again with a flat heel there. Um, what I will do is there's a very useful typology of pipe stems and sizes. I'll put this up at the end and leave that on for a few minutes and that will give you an idea of all the sizes and dates as well so you can date your own finds more easily. Um, so yeah 1600s um, perhaps if I can show three together, that might be a best way of explaining it. So you've got 17th century pipes uh, from sort of 1620 to 1640, 1640 to 1660, and then sort of um, slightly larger, but still with a pronounced curve, um, would be sort of 1680 to 1710. So you can see they are growing in size and also in length. Um, the earliest pipes were um, quite short, um, about three inches long in 1600. By 1640 a complete pipe would be eight inches long. By 1680 they'd grown to 11 inches long. Um, not that you find many complete ones on the Thames, but it does happen. Mostly that's just the bowl and the stem broken. Um, as I said, the, the earlier 17th century pipes always had a flat heel. Um, but throughout, towards the middle of the century, you start to get a little spur heel coming up from about uh, 1650 onwards. Um, so that's also an indication that that's not very early 17th century, but a bit later. Um, Marking of pipes. Um, marking is quite unusual in early pipes and always collectible. Um, a lot of early pipes, if they were marked, were marked on the heel. I hope you can see that there. That's just a design, it's not actually a name. Uh, it's a wheel with uh, spokes and little dots within the spokes there. Um, and these are always very collectible and very sought after. Uh, there's another example marked on the base of the heel, uh, early 17th century. This one, sort of 1620s, 1640. Um, they're lovely things. I mean, it's amazing to be able to, you know, hold an object that's so easily found that would have been smoked, you know, the middle of the 17th century, the Civil War period. Um, there are other markings known. Uh, they're normally very rare. Um, in London you get a very rare pipes that are dated in 1680s 
um, and other markings are known. Um, Dutch pipes had more decoration and they would have bands of decoration stamped along the stem um, impressed by hand and that is known from London as well but I say it's very rare. Most of the pipes in this era completely unmarked um, so if you do find a marked one then you're doing very well. Um, as we move forward into the 18th century as I said by the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century, so 1680 to 1710, start to get um, a much taller bowl and a much longer stem and this continues um, throughout the 18th century so you get these very nice large upright stems without a sort of barrel shape anymore, they're very sort of smooth sided like that and uh, longer stems. This is the longest one I've been able to find and this is a very low tide in an area that doesn't get a lot of um, exposure and a lot of waves crashing around which would break the stem up. Uh, this was in three pieces and the three pieces were sitting right next to each other so that's nice. Um, some of the 18th century pipes are extremely long, I mean they're known as church warden pipes. Uh, you can get stems up to 24 inches long, the average is about 15 inches long I think um, and that would enable the smoker to actually sit uh, in a coffee house or at home uh, and have the pipe in his mouth and the bowl resting on the table so I suppose your hands free to read the latest broadsheet or discuss business with your peers. Um, there isn't a lot of variation in the design of pipes in the 18th century um, from about 1710 to 1780 they do pretty much um, stay the same as that. Um, there are some things uh, that, that do happen in the 18th century. You start to get initial marking on the base there. You can see letters on either side. That comes from about 1700 onwards and that continues right through into the Victorian period. Um, and that would be the maker's mark. So the first name and the surname and uh, if you hold the pipe stem away from you then on the left hand side is the person's Christian name and on the right hand side is the person's surname. So if I do that, I'm now holding it away from you. So on the left hand side is Christian name, first name of the maker and on the right hand side is the surname of the maker. So in this case uh, you have uh, S and a P um, and there are lists you can consult uh, which do list London makers in books and there was a nice website um, but it's been taken down temporarily but I hope it will be back uh, which will eventually list all known marks of London pipes um, starting with the earliest. Um, uh, there's a slight complication in that a lot of common initials you know, like RC or WB uh, are used about five times by different people but obviously if you've got um, a bowl that you can date you know to a century or to part of a century you might be able to narrow down the maker and actually identify who made the pipe. Um, also rarely in the 18th century you do get some heel marking uh, and this is marked WT um, probably a London maker but he can't be identified um, that's more unusual than the letter marking either side so that's a nice find anything with an unusual marking is very collectible there um, another thing that comes in in the 18th century are highly decorated bowls um, from about 1730, uh, very popular about 1760 during the Seven Years War period when we were feeling uh, very patriotic and we were carrying on civil wars in Europe uh, you get the Hanoverian coat of arms, the royal coat of arms and other sort of uh, armorial designs uh, actually on the back of the bowl rather than the front of the bowl sometimes uh, and there's one there from the 1740-1760 uh, you've got dolphins surrounding a coat of arms, I'm not sure whose coat of arms they are um, but again the same uh, shape of pipe as the classic 18th century pipe but now it's highly decorated and those are very um, sought after as well Um, moving on then um, towards the end of the 18th century, 1790s, and on into the late Georgian period, 1820s, 
Um, the bowls and the stems start to shrink down a bit. Um, so you do tend to get smaller pipes. Uh, so that would be a typical pipe of around 1820. Um, so you can see if we compare it uh, with an 18th century one, the bowl has shrunk a little bit and it's a little bit more curved. Um, and that would go forward into a classic Victorian shape which is shorter and rounder and wider at the top there. Um, these ones, um, they're often marked on the back of the bowl. I hope you can see that there. Um, there's a nice shield and it does actually have the maker's full name, uh, Critchfield of London, in a shield with the London crest uh, in the middle of that. So that's nice to have something identifiable. Uh, and also they put a little design on the heel as well. I'm not quite sure what it's supposed to symbolise. As well as letters on the heels, um, you do get uh, pictorial things as well. That uh, is a symbol on the heel of an 18th century pipe. Uh, not quite sure if it's a gloved hand grasping a ball or possibly a comet, something like that. But uh, rather than a letter, there's nothing on the other side. So moving forward into the Victorian period, uh, from about 1840 onwards, uh, you start getting an explosion of designs, uh, not only on the bowl, uh, like that, but also um, pipes which are shaped as different objects, people's heads, um, parts of the body, um, you get commemorative pipes. Uh, here's a very nice pipe I found actually before I even got to London on my way to my mudlarking trip. Uh, they'd put in a new fence at my local station and they'd unearthed that, uh, which is a lovely pictorial bowl. Uh, commemorative pipes, this commemorates the International Exhibition of 1862, which was held in South Kensington on the ground, which is now the museums. Um, was uh, even bigger and better than the 1851 exhibition and that shows the building, uh, the glass um, building uh, for the exhibition uh, and there's a tree on the back because there was a full-size tree inside the exhibition hall there. Um, and these pipes are very collectible, there's a whole variety of different shapes, thousands and thousands of designs made in France and England and elsewhere um, highly collectible and there's a huge variety of them as I said. Um, here's a complete pipe which I found from this period, Victorian period. Uh, as you can see it's got no heel at all, like that. And the design is a snake sort of moving through the water, so a sort of water snake. Um, and it's about five inches long. Uh, it's the only complete pipe I found in the Thames. Uh, and if I hadn't have picked it up it would have been smashed to smithereens by the next tide I would think. I uh, found it underneath Cannon Street Railway Bridge, so I like to think that one of the engineers or workmen more likely that were building the bridge dropped it into the water and it was unearthed by a tide there. Yeah, the Victorian love of decorated pipes continues right up to the 1880s and beyond. Um, from the 1880s, when machines were introduced which could make cigarettes by mass production, um, this really sounds the end of the clay pipe as a popular smoking device. Um, cigarettes take over, sadly, um, and the clay pipe uh, sadly dies out around this period. It's still made about 1900, but only by one or two makers, uh, and often for children to blow bubbles with rather than for serious smokers or just as commemorative items. Um, uh, there's a few um, other oddities I'd like to show you. Um, there's this thing which is made out of pipe clay, uh, it took me a while to identify that, and actually someone had to identify it for me on an online forum. Um, it is obviously pierced through, like that, but it is a cigar holder, and this would be from the late 19th century, sort of 1890s, um, 1880s, up to about 1910, and you just put your cigar into that and have it as a holder there, and that's why it's got that sort of rolled leaf design on it because it looks like a cigar. Um, actually very rare because most people who um, afforded cigars would have used um, an amber holder or a metal holder or some more expensive thing. Um, so that was an interesting find from the Thames. 
Um, this one I didn't find in the Thames, I found it in Malta, uh, but it's actually an Ottoman pipe, so a Turkish pipe, which were also common around Eastern Europe as well, Greece and into the former Yugoslavia, and all around the Middle East. Uh, made in Turkey, red clay obviously rather than white clay, uh, it's a bit battered, but it's got a very wide bowl and would have had a long wooden stem so that you could smoke it a bit like a church warden. Um, and these are common in parts of Europe. Um, I guess there must be a few in the Thames as well. Um, and they're quite highly decorated and stamped. Uh, you can just see their uh, stamped decoration on it. Um, the ones that are open were for tobacco. There were some with a mesh in the clay as well, which were for smoking hashish as well, which was common in the Middle East. Um, there's a couple of good books uh, which you can pick up to do with clay pipes. Uh, as usual, Shire have produced an excellent short guide. Uh, they pack in a lot of information into their books and I do recommend them on every subject. Clay Tobacco Pipes by Eric G. Ato. Um, and that gives you a full list of um, full information on dating and illustrates how they were made and lots of the collectible designs from the Victorian period. So I recommend that, that's cheaply available online. Um, for London, uh, a little bit more expensive, it's been out of print for a long time, is London Clay Tobacco Pipes by David Atkinson and Adrian Oswald, um, published by the Museum of London in the 70s, um, so probably a little bit out of date I would think. But it does illustrate a lot of um, more unusual markings and London pipes, there's some nice 18th century armorial pipes there, and it does have a list of known makers uh, which you can compare with your initials on the pipes you find. Okay, well I hope that that has uh, whet your appetite for clay pipes and that you will appreciate the ones that you pick up when you're mudlarking or walks in the country or in excavations a little bit more. Thank you very much. Bye.